Hi, I'm Scott Brady, and welcome to the Why JSON Web Tokens module of the JSON Web Token Fundamentals course on Pluralsight. In this module, we're going to keep things high level, focusing on the what, when, why, and how of JSON Web Tokens. As a result, you'll learn to recognize the telltale signs of a JSON Web Token and understand their basic structure, allowing you to spot and read any tokens that might come your way. You'll learn how JSON Web Tokens are great for use with protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect, and the best way to include them in a request to a web service. You'll also see some good use cases for when you should use JSON Web Tokens, and perhaps more importantly, some use cases where JSON Web Tokens aren't a good fit. And finally, you'll learn about the wider range of standards around JSON Web Tokens with Jose, which is an acronym for JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption. Let's make a start. This is a JSON Web Token. I know this not just because I created it, but because I can see three segments each separated by a dot. I can see that it only contains characters from a base64 URL character set, and that the first two segments start with E, Y, J. This is a clear sign of base64 encoded JSON, because when decoded, it reveals a left curly brace followed by a double quote. That's very nice, but what is a JSON web token? A JSON web token is a standardized security token format that allows you to create a JSON payload that you can send to another party without the fear of anyone tampering with it. It achieves this using digital signatures. We'll cover digital signatures in greater detail later in this course, but at a high level, a digital signature allows you to prove that a trusted party created the token and that no one has tampered with it. So that means I can create a JSON web token, send it over the internet to someone else, and they will be able to verify that the data inside the token is valid, that an attacker has not changed the data in any way, and that it was me who created it. This secure transmission of data is the main use case of JSON web tokens. As you saw earlier, a JSON web token has three segments, each of which contains data that has been base64 URL encoded. The first section is the header, which, when decoded, contains JSON that describes the token itself. It gives you an idea of how you should read and validate the token's data and signature. For example, the header tells you you should validate the token's signature using the ES256 algorithm and a public key with the following identifier. The second section is the payload. The payload is the content of the token itself, the JSON object that you are protecting and transmitting to another party. The data in the payload consists of what we call claims, which are statements about an entity made by the token's creator. This entity could be a user that the JSON web token represents in some way, or it could be the requesting service. In this example payload, you can see many of the standard claims used in a JSON web token. For example, who issued the token, who is meant to read it, the token subject or who the token represents, and when the token will expire. We'll take an in-depth look at these standard claim types later in this course. The final section is the signature. Generated using the data from the header and the payload, along with the issuer's signing key. This section is simply the base64 URL encoded signature value, rather than another JSON object. The length of the signature depends on the algorithm used to generate it and, in some cases, the size of the signing key itself. Before we look at JSON Web Tokens any further, let's briefly talk about how to pronounce JSON Web Token. The full name is a bit of a mouthful, 
and it's no fun to say or write over and over again. As a result, you'll often see people use the acronym JWT, which you'll sometimes see pronounced in full as JWT, or abbreviated as JOT, with JOT being the suggested pronunciation from the original JSON Web Token standard. I've heard many other ways of saying JOT over the years, with a range of syllables and organization specific twists. But the most common and accessible names are JSON Web Token, JWT, and JOT. If you're using one of these three, other people will likely understand what you are talking about. Personally, I prefer JOT or the full name, so I'll be using those throughout the rest of this course. You've seen the basic anatomy of a JOT. Now let's talk about the use case. What problem are they trying to solve and why do they exist? Jots on their own are not that interesting. However, they open up a world of possibilities when combined with protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect. In fact, JSON web tokens were initially created as part of the OAuth working group. This was due to the demand for a JSON representation of claims in a format suitable as a self-contained OAuth access token or even as an alternative to SAML assertions, which are being used in some edge case OAuth flows. This prompted the working group to create a new token format that represented claims as JSON, was compact enough to fit into an authorization header, URL safe so that it could fit into a query string parameter, and could be verified locally thanks to an authenticated integrity check or a digital signature. While there were multiple competing standards to achieve this, JSON Web Tokens came out on top. To understand these requirements, let's have a recap of the OAuth use case. OAuth 2 is an authorization protocol built for HTTP APIs. It's the go-to protocol if you want to authorize access to your APIs. That being said, I prefer to call it a delegation protocol. This is because OAuth allows an application to ask the user, can I access this protected resource on your behalf? OAuth enables a user to say yes to this, consenting to the application's request without giving it their credentials. Let's see how OAuth achieves that and where JOTS can help. In OAuth, you have four players. A protected resource, which lives in an API, and a client application, which is the application that wants to access the protected resource on a user's behalf. We then have the resource owner, the user who delegates access to the protected resource. They are allowing access to their data or for something to happen at the protected resource. In some cases, the resource owner could be a machine, but let's focus on the user flows for now. And finally, you have the authorization server, which is responsible for handling authorization requests, authenticating users, and issuing tokens. To begin an OAuth request, the client application makes an authorization request to the authorization server. This happens via a redirect in the browser so that the resource owner navigates to the authorization server. Once the user has navigated to the authorization server, the authorization request is validated to be from a known client application and the user is asked to authenticate themselves in order to consent to the application acting on their behalf. After consent, the user is again redirected back to the client application. In this redirect, the authorization server includes what's known as the authorization grant. This grant is a physical representation of the user's consent that the client application can act on their behalf. The client application then calls the token endpoint of the authorization server, sending the grant it received alongside some credentials of its own that prove it is a legitimate client application. 
This client authentication and token request ideally happen away from the browser. If everything checks out, the authorization server responds with an access token. This access token is then attached to a request for the protected resource whenever the application wants to act on the user's behalf. When the protected resource receives an access token, it must somehow verify it. It must verify that the access token was issued by an authorization server that it trusts, and then understand who authorized the request and what permissions they delegated to the client application. If everything checks out, the client application is allowed access. While OAuth provides an amazing framework for authorizing access to APIs, it didn't define what an access token looks like or how an API should read or validate one. Understanding what an access token means is essential to the API. At a minimum, the API needs to understand what permissions were granted to the client application, the duration of access, and who granted the access. The examples used in the OAuth 2 specification used unstructured random values which I would say became the default for many early implementations of OAuth. This format uses a variety of approaches for validation, and it isn't unusual for the token to simply reference an entry in a token store somewhere. The API could pull the data from the token store, or maybe it needs to make a call to the authorization server itself to find out if the token is valid and what it means. This is great for token revocation, as all APIs must call a single place to find out if the token is valid. But many implementers wanted something simpler. Something that doesn't require a further call to a database or an external service. Something self-contained that the API could validate all on its own. This is where JSON web tokens come in. When using a JOT for an access token, you get a self-contained token that can be parsed and validated by the API without making any calls to the authorization server or a data store. This made JOTS so popular in OAuth implementations that the OAuth working group created a standard dedicated to this use case, which we'll look at later in this course. Another use case for JOTS is with another open standard called OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect builds upon OAuth by adding a layer of identity facilitated by a new token type, the identity token. An identity token is intended for the client application rather than the API. At a high level, the identity token describes how the user authenticated so that the client application can decide if it wants to let the user start a session. An identity token is always a JSON web token. In this use case, the JOT is very similar to a SAML assertion, which is a security token from an earlier standard called SAML2. Both are used to describe how the user authenticated. Both optionally describe the user's identity, and both are digitally signed by the identity provider. However, let's compare the two formats. This is an identity token, which is always a JOT. And this is your typical SAML assertion, describing almost exactly the same thing. And this is why JSON web tokens are considered compact. To learn more about OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, check out my Pluralsight course, Getting Started with OAuth 2. This course gives you a deep dive into the OAuth protocol, which is vital to understand if you intend to use JOTs as OAuth access tokens. This course even discusses modern architectures where you might not even need to use OAuth and JOTS at all. I'll be recommending you use this course to brush up on OAuth fairly often throughout this course. So you have a JSON web token, you know how to decode it, and you've seen some use cases for when you would use one. But how are JOTS used? Let's take a look at how JOTS can be used with our OAuth use case for authorizing access to an API. Jots are designed to be compact enough to fit into a HTTP request header or URI 
This means they are also URL safe, thanks to their use of Base64 URL encoding. However, the URL is the last place you would want to use a jot. Let's take a look at why. In a HTTP request, you have a few options for where to place something like a jot. These are the URL path, the query string, the header, or the body. As you've seen already, a jot is a credential that authorizes access to a system. On their own, you can use them much like a password, where just showing that you know the token is enough to get into the system. A wolf can use them as bearer tokens, which means much the same, that simply having the jot is all that you need to access an API on the user's behalf. Its presence in the HTTP request is all that is needed. This means that your JOT should be considered a secret, just like any other credential. Not only does this mean that you should protect your tokens at rest while not using them, but you must also protect them in transit when using the token in a HTTP request. As a result, when using a JOT, you should always use transport layer security. However, while transport layer security will encrypt each element of the request, some parts are more secure than others. When a web server receives a HTTP request, one of the first things it will do is decrypt the URL to know where to route the request. Unfortunately, the second thing it will do is write that URL to its server trace logs. If your jot is in the path or query string, this would mean that your jot is now written in plain text in a file on your web server. These logs are a good target for attackers, and depending on what data you may have in the token, it could mean that you are leaking both the user's personal information along with their credentials. This rules out the path and the query string, despite jots being called URL safe. The choice between the header and the body comes down to best practices built over time by OAuth and other HTTP based security standards that frequently use the authorization header. The authorization header is a standard way of including credentials in your request so that you can authenticate yourself to a web server and access a protected resource. With an authorization header, you must first define the scheme you are using before the encoded credentials themselves. These schemes are usually well known and standardized, such as basic and digest, or some of the Windows authentication options, such as Negotiate. But in theory, it could be something custom. OAuth 2 defines the bearer scheme, which means that anyone in possession of the token can use it to access a protected resource by simply adding it to the authorization header. In this case, the bearer token is our jot. If the credentials in the authorization header are valid, the request can be processed by the API. However, if the request is missing an authorization header, or the credential supplied in the header is invalid, the web server should return a response with a status code of 401 unauthorized. This response can then include another special header, the www authenticate header. This header describes how the requesting user agent can authenticate access to the service. This can include what authentication schemes are supported and further information about how those schemes can be used. This is not only good practice when building authentication into your web servers, but it's also a perfect fit for using JSON web tokens. With the bearer scheme, this header can include a realm, which is where the requesting party can get a token to access the API. This can also include error codes and an error description, such as the one here saying that the token they tried to use has expired. If the token is valid, but the request itself cannot be authorized due to a permissions error, then a 403 forbidden can be returned. For example, the token was valid, but the user the token represented wasn't authorized to perform this functionality. So while you could put the token in the request body, this misses out on the benefits of the authorization header. And depending on your interpretation of some of the HTTP standards or the web server you are using, you shouldn't send a request body with some HTTP methods 
such as get and delete. However, the authorization header is allowed with any HTTP method. Let's take a look at when you should use JSON Web Tokens. You've seen some of these already, but let's take a closer look at patterns when JOTs work really well. The best use case for JOTs is authorizing access to a HTTP API. In this scenario, the requesting party has a JOT, and it uses it as a credential to access the API. For this to work, the API must know and trust the issuer of the JOT, and be able to validate the token. This could mean that the requesting party is the token issuer, or maybe it's using an access token from an OAuth authorization server. Either way, the API must know about the issuing party beforehand and expect to receive tokens from them. In this scenario, JOTs allow you stateless access to the API and cross-site requests for distributed systems that either know and trust each other or know and trust a token service, as with OAuth's authorization server. Another use case is the transfer of information. Like with OpenID Connect's identity token, where the token issuer sends a protected signed payload to the recipient. The recipient can then read and validate the token and take steps based on the information, such as starting a session for that user. JOTs can also be used as security proofs. A JOTs digital signature can only be created using a private key that only one entity should know. Therefore, the ability to create a signed JOT can prove that the entity knows this private key. Building upon this, the JOT payload could be used for unique values providing correlation and authenticated information about the proof itself. JOTs are frequently used this way in OAuth for client authentication, protecting request parameters, and proof of possession. They're quite a simple technique to use asymmetric cryptography for verifying an identity. Due to their widespread use, JOTs can really be useful for information transfer and as security proofs. If you need interoperability, then it's a format you know most people will be able to support. In my opinion, the best way to use JOTs is in the context of protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect, where their usage is well defined and there is a low chance of misuse, of falling into some of the traps that you will see throughout this course. For the rest of this course, we will focus on JOTs in this context. However, the theory you learn will apply to any JOT use case. If you have a custom use case, I recommend you continue watching this module to learn when not to use JOTs before making up your mind on whether or not you should use them. You've seen how JOTs are a great use case for standardized security protocols. Now let's discuss when they are not a good fit. To understand when not to use them, let's look at what JOTs don't handle so well. JOTs are not a replacement for cookies and managing web sessions. While they are great as security tokens to access APIs, they aren't so good at representing a user's session within a website. With traditional web sessions, the user logs into a website and is issued a cookie. The browser then attaches this cookie on each subsequent request to that website, allowing the website to identify the current session. This server-based approach is great since only a reference to the session really needs to be stored in the cookie, with all session-related data stored server-side. This allows easy invalidation of sessions, where you can delete the session from the server, invalidating the cookie stored in the browser. It also means you could take advantage of the browser's secure storage container for cookies. Using JOTs for sessions loses the browser's out-of-the-box functionality for managing sessions and cookies.
Instead, you'll need to implement both token storage and management yourself. You also don't get access to any secure storage. Instead, you only get storage that is accessible to JavaScript in the browser, and therefore expose yourself to a whole range of new attack vectors. There is also no way to invalidate a jot. Once you create it, it is valid until it expires. And you did include an expiry claim, right? One way around this is to use a block list of bad tokens. But this becomes harder to maintain the more systems you build. And it removes some of the stateless benefits that jots give you. Unfortunately, using jots for sessions is a common mistake when building single page applications and in some language or framework specific communities. Do try to avoid this as it can make your applications difficult to scale and often more vulnerable to jot related or session based attacks. To do user authentication and session management properly in these kinds of applications, consider using OpenID Connect and the backend for front-end pattern, both of which you can learn more about in my OAuth course on Pluralsight. To learn more about why Jots shouldn't be used for sessions, check out this excellent analysis by Everett Pott. As you saw earlier, Jots are stateless with a set expiration. Once you issue the token, it is valid until that expiration date. There is no way to invalidate an individual token without making the token validator aware. For example, you would have to tell the validator that they should not trust a particular token and for them to start building up a list of blocked tokens. The same is true for single use tokens. For some journeys such as password reset or step up authentication, you may want to use short lived single use tokens. Again, jots are not suitable for this use case as nothing stops them from being used repeatedly without maintaining a list of consumed tokens. For these use cases, it is often better to use a stateful token rather than a stateless token such as a jot. A stateful token would likely be unstructured opaque data that is a reference to claims stored in a token store. You can almost think of it as a reference to a jot payload in a database. While this does mean that you need to call the database or maybe an external API, it does mean that one-time use and revocation are built into the token validation itself. To learn more about this approach, take a look into OAuth's introspection functionality. While you can use a block list of invalid or consumed JSON web tokens, in my opinion, this is more difficult to implement and maintain than a traditional stateful approach, with it being both harder to scale and ultimately undermining the stateless benefits of using jots. We'll take a look at jot revocation mechanisms in the best practices module near the end of this course. Another use case where jots are unsuitable is for sharing application specific or permission data. One reason for this is that jot payloads should be kept small. Once you start filling them full of application data, such as the user subscriptions or account state, you will soon hit maximum header sizes for many web servers. This data is also prone to change frequently and could have security implications if not acted upon immediately. This issue becomes clearer once you start adding user level permissions to the token, such as roles and entitlements. We've all seen how roles-based access control can become unmaintainable. Now imagine putting all of those roles inside a jot. A better approach would be to have a jot only contain data that is unlikely to change during the token's lifetime. For example, identity data that might help you inform an authorization decision rather than the result of it. This could be things such as the department the user works in, and their role within that department. This kind of data typically doesn't change hour to hour, and if it does, waiting for a token expiration or even issuing a new token 
would not be the worst thing. For application level data and permissions, I recommend you keep them close to the application itself, rather than in the jot. Before we deep dive into how jots work, let's take a moment to review the core standards for JSON Web Tokens. While the original JOT standard is part of the OAuth Working Group at the Internet Engineering Task Force, due to the complexity of the technology, subsequent standards are part of a dedicated working group, the JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption Group, otherwise affectionately known as Jose. There are five standards that make up the core of Jose. One for the core JOT format, one for signing, one for encryption, one for a shareable key format, and one for the signing and encryption algorithms themselves. While there are other standards in the Jose suite of specifications, these five comprise the core of the technology, and they are what you'll be learning about in this course. So let's take a quick look at each one. The core JOT standard lays out the basic structure of the token the header and the payload structure, basic creation and validation procedures, and standard claim types such as expiry, subject, and issuer. The JWS standard shows how to sign JSON Web Tokens, providing the integrity check core to a JOT security. So far when you've seen a JOT in this course, you've actually been shown signed JOTs, and that's because a JOT should always be signed. It's this standard that shows you how to do that and how to validate the signature. We'll discuss creation and validation procedures in depth in the next module and various signing algorithms available to you a bit later in this course. The JWE standard presents an alternative token format where a JOT is encrypted rather than only signed. This format is useful for protecting the token's payload keeping it confidential rather than plain text as with a normal JOT. This format is not as common as JWS, but it can be very useful depending on your use case. The focus of this course will be on signed JOTs, and JWS is what I'll be referring to when I say JOT. However, you will get to learn more about JWE later in this course in its own dedicated module. JWK offers a standardized way of presenting cryptographic keys as JSON objects. This is very useful in protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect, which define metadata documents that can include a list of keys that can be used to verify tokens. This enables a token validator to automatically download a collection of keys in order to validate JOT signatures. JWA lists the core identifiers used throughout the Jose family of standards. These are the cryptographic algorithm identifiers, such as RS-256 and HS-256. It also defines the parameter names used to define keys in a JSON web key. All of these standards register various header parameters, standard claim types, and shorthand algorithm names. These are registered with the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority to prevent duplicate values from being created. You can find an up-to-date list of all registered values on Jose's Assignments page. Throughout this course, you'll mainly learn about JOT, JWS, and JWE. JWK and JWA will be covered, however, they will not be the focus. In this course, I will only cover the JSON compact serialization used by the JOT standards. The less popular JSON serialization will not be covered. In this module, you learned about the basic structure of a JSON web token with its header, payload, and signature, all encoded with base64 URL. You saw how JOTs work great as stateless OAuth access tokens and as OpenID Connect identity tokens, and how to securely use them in a HTTP request to gain authorized access to an API, thanks to the authorization header. 
you also learned that you should mainly use JOTs with protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect so that you could avoid common JOT issues thanks to standardized token formats and validation. You'll see a lot more about this in the next module. You then saw that you should not use JOTs for browser sessions or when you have a requirement for instant token revocation. And finally, you saw how JOTs are part of the Jose suite of standards, which includes how to sign tokens, encrypt them, and the various algorithms and keys you can use with them. There's already been a lot of talk about OAuth in this course, as it's one of the most obvious use cases for JSON web tokens. If you don't have any experience with OAuth, I do recommend watching my Getting Started with OAuth course to gain a broader understanding. But for now, let's deep dive into how tokens are created and validated. Hi, I'm Scott Brady, and welcome to the Using JSON Web Tokens module of the JOT Fundamentals course on Pluralsight. In this module, you will learn how JOTs are created, their standard headers and payloads, how they are encoded, and how to prepare the token for signing. You will see how to validate that same token, including when to reject the token based on its payload or signature. You'll see the standard claim types used in JSON Web Tokens, what they mean, how to validate them, and how they work together to create a secure token, and how JOTs are used with standardized protocols, focusing on OpenID Connect identity tokens and OAuth access tokens. You'll also see some online tools that can help you quickly create and validate JSON web tokens. These tools are invaluable when debugging or writing code samples and documentation. And finally, you'll see some JOT libraries in action, focusing on common APIs for creating and validating tokens. Hopefully you'll see how, once you know the theory behind JOTs, you can pick up any well-designed JOT library and run with it. Let's start with token creation, focusing on the steps involved and the minimum requirements to create a JOT in a modern implementation. As you've seen already, JOTs rely on a digital signature for integrity and authentication. With JOTs, you ideally use asymmetric cryptography, where you use a private key to create a signature and a corresponding public key to validate it. This ensures that only someone who knows the secret private key can create tokens, while many people can validate them using a public key. We'll go into more detail on how all this works and what these keys look like in the module JWS in depth. So as a token issuer, your first step is to have a private key that only you know. The next step is to create the token header. As you saw before, the header describes the token and provides the recipient with hints on how to validate it. Let's start with the type header. By default, the media type is simply JWT, which is all uppercase for legacy support. However, officially, it is not case sensitive. You could include the application prefix, but this is discouraged. Historically, this has always been JOT, but newer standards have started to make use of the media type with values such as AT plus JWT to signify that the JOT is an OAuth access token and that the verifier must use a specific validation profile. Since this will be a signed JOT, the header must contain an algorithm parameter. This header tells the recipient what signing algorithm has been used to sign the token and therefore what algorithm they should use to validate the signature. Algorithm values are defined in the JWA standard. However, some newer standards bring additional values that represent modern signing algorithms. We'll deep dive into these values and algorithms in the module JWS in depth. The final header I will recommend now is the key ID parameter which defines what public key the recipient should use to validate the token. This ID can be useful when you have multiple public keys for a token issuer or for identifying that the signing key has changed. 
Out of these three headers, only the algorithm parameter is mandatory for a signed jot. However, I highly recommend using the key ID header to make debugging easier. Without the key ID header, it can be tough to identify that you are trying to validate the token using the wrong key. Next is the payload, a JSON object containing your claims. You'll see the key jot claim shortly, but for now, let's just use the minimum you would expect to see in any JSON web token. First up are some claims about who issued the token and who should read the token. These are a huge help during token validation, and when you have more than one token issuer and more than one application receiving tokens. Next is the token expiry. This is when the token will expire and should no longer be trusted. This value is in Unix time, which is the number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970. Without an expiration, your token would be valid forever. Similar to this is the issued at claim, which is when the token was created. This is again in Unix time and allows for lifetime calculations to be made by the verifier. If your token represents an entity, then you should include the subject claim with a unique identifier for that user. For example, the subject could be the user who authorized the request, or even the application making the request. Beyond that, it's up to you. For example, you could include some basic identity data or protocol specific data. Just remember that these claims will be in plain text by default, unless you decide to encrypt the token with JSON web encryption. With your header and payload created, you now need to encode the data ready for it to be signed. As you've already seen, each segment is base64 URL encoded. Base64 URL encoding is the same as your standard base64 encoding, just with a slightly different character set that replaces any characters that might interfere with the parsing of a URL. So that means you replace the use of the plus sign and forward slash, and remove the equal sign, which is Base64's padding character. To encode the header, you must first get the UTF-8 bytes of the JSON string, and then Base64 URL encode it. This results in a value like this. In this instance, the white space and line breaks around any JSON values or structural characters have been removed. While this isn't strictly required, I have yet to use a JOT library that doesn't do this automatically. The payload goes through the same process, by again first transforming the message to its UTF-8 representation, and then Base64 URL encoding it. With these encoded values, you can now parse the data you need to sign, which is simply the encoded header and payload concatenated and delimited with a full stop character. The ASCII representation of this value is then signed using your private key and signing algorithm of choice. The result of this is itself base64 URL encoded. And finally, appended to the encoded header and payload, again delimited with a full stop. This is your JSON web token. Now that you've created a JSON web token, let's look at how the recipient will validate it. The first step is to verify the format of the token, to check that it has three segments, delimited by a full stop, and therefore using JWS. You can then verify that the token only contains base64 URL encoded data, which when decoded contains a header and a payload with the UTF-8 representation of a JSON object. If these initial checks do not pass, you can save yourself some processing and reject the token outright. The next step is to validate the header to ensure it only contains values you understand. For example, do you have a public key with this ID suitable for this algorithm? If you expect a different algorithm or do not recognize the key, then you must reject the token. 
if you are accepting tokens from many different token issuers, then it is also a good idea to check that the key used to sign the token is associated with the issuer of that token. This helps mitigate mix-up attacks, where a malicious token issuer tries to impersonate a different issuer. At this point, it's also a good idea to validate any security data within the payload itself. For example, are you the token's intended audience, or has the token expired? Any other payload validation can most likely wait until you have finished validating the rest of the token. If everything checks out, you can validate the signature. This requires you to parse the same data that was originally signed, which is the ASCII bytes of the encoded header and the payload, including the dot that separates them. You can then verify the signature using the agreed signing algorithm and public key. This signature validation is vital to the security of the token and proves that the header and the payload are valid and have not been tampered with. Always validate a jot. Decoding or reading the token alone is not enough. Once you have validated the token, you can turn your attention to the rest of the payload. Payload validation is usually specific to the recipient application and the request being made. Beyond the core JOT claims you'll see in this module, when a payload fails validation, it is usually because of an authorization rule for the request rather than an issue with the token itself. For example, when the user represented in the token is not allowed to access this resource. This would likely result in a 403 forbidden rather than the 401 unauthorized, which you would receive with an invalid token. Now that you know the basics behind JOT creation and validation, let's look at the claim types registered in the core JSON web token standard. You've seen a few of these already, as I made a point of using them in previous examples. That's because even though the standards mark them as optional, you really need to use these claim types in order to use JSON web tokens securely. In fact, most modern JOT libraries will require you to include most of these claims by default. Let's take a closer look at these claims, what they mean, how to create their values, and how to validate them. First up is the issuer claim. The issuer is the unique identifier of who created the token. While the value can be any case sensitive string or URI, most protocols tend to use the base URI of the host website. Using a domain you own is a decent convention to use in order to keep the issuer unique and to prove ownership. Issuer validation allows you to verify that you know the token issuer. After all, you should never trust tokens from an unknown party, but it is also important when validating the signature and subject claim. With signatures, it allows you to check that the key used to sign the token is associated with this issuer, preventing mix-up attacks where one issuer tries to issue tokens to impersonate users from another system. It can also be used in the same way to validate the subject. You should always check that the subject is associated with the issuer. If the subject value is known to you, but belongs to a different issuer, then you must reject the token. Next is the audience, the unique identifier of the token recipient. This is again a string or URI, and while a base URL or authority domain would be useful again, in my experience this value can be anything. The audience claim can also be an array of values, meaning that the token is valid for multiple audiences. Having one token that can call multiple applications can be useful, but be aware that any one of those applications could replay the token, calling one of the other audiences of the token without your knowledge. After all, with the use of JOTS and the bearer scheme, the token validator cannot prove that the entity using the token is the same entity that was issued the token. Depending on your scenario, it may be safer for you to use a single token per audience. The subject claim identifies the entity that the token represents. 
most of the payload is claims the issuer makes about this subject. For example, the name and email claim would be claims about the user identified in the subject claim. The subject claim is again a case sensitive string or URI. In my experience, this value is often the user's unique identifier within the issuer. Ideally, it should be a globally unique, opaque value that never changes. It should never be something like an email address. But unfortunately, that does depend on the values the issuer uses that you may have no control over. The value could also represent another system where no user is present in the request. Instead, you have two machines talking to one another. Next is the expires at claim, which is the UTC date time after which the token is no longer valid. Once issued, unless you do something drastic like change the signing key, a job will remain valid until its expiry time. This value uses Unix epoch time, which is the number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970 UTC, ignoring leap seconds. It's not uncommon for a token validator to give a bit of leeway when validating this date time to account for clock skew between systems. However, this should be the case of allowing a few extra minutes past the token's expiry rather than hours. Most libraries I've used default to 30 to 60 seconds for clock skew. But how much you allow for will depend on the sensitivity of the applications you are creating. We then have the issued at claim, which is the UTC date time of when the token was created. This is again in Unix epoch time. This claim may not initially seem all that useful when compared to the expires at claim, but issued at enables the verifier to enforce custom token lifetime rules. For example, you may have an API that manages highly sensitive data and can therefore only trust recently issued tokens or tokens that only live for a few minutes. By evaluating the issued at claim along with the expiry, you can calculate how old the token is and enforce authorization rules based on this. Then there is the not before claim. If this date time is not in the past, then the verifier must reject the token. This claim allows you to create a token that will become valid in the future. And finally, we have the JOT ID. This is a unique identifier for an individual JSON web token. This identifier allows you to populate block lists of tokens at the validator so that it can block revoked tokens. It can also be used as a mechanism to enforce one-time use tokens. Values for this claim must therefore have a negligible chance of having collisions. However, as we discussed earlier, block lists of JOTs or JOT IDs limit your ability to scale and may undermine architectural decisions by losing the benefits of stateless tokens. In the original JOT standard, these claims are known as registered claims. However, newer standards have since registered other claim types. You can find a list of these in the JOT specific IANA registry. These are known as public claims. You can use custom claims in a JOT payload using any type you wish. These are known as private claims. However, before creating your own claim types, give the JOT registry a quick check first there may already be a standards-based alternative. Now that you've seen the core claim types and how JOTs are created and validated, let's see how the OpenID Connect standard uses JOTs to tell applications how a user authenticated, facilitating single sign-on. OpenID Connect builds upon OAuth with a layer of identity. And one of the main ways it achieves this is by introducing a new token type, the identity token. The OAuth authorization server is now acting as an identity provider, responsible for authenticating the user and creating identity tokens. An identity token describes the authentication event itself. It describes how the user verified their identity. 
Unlike an OAuth access token, which is intended for accessing an API, the identity token is intended for the client application. The application that made the request to the identity provider, asking to know who the user is and how they authenticated. The client application will validate the identity token, look at how the user authenticated, and decide whether or not to start a session for that user. If everything checks out, the client application can start a session for the user. Otherwise, it may redirect the user back to the identity provider, asking them to re-authenticate or even authenticate in a different way. Let's take a look at a typical identity token and how OpenID Connect makes use of JSON web tokens to communicate how the user authenticated. Unlike the core JOT standard, OpenID Connect enforces the use of issuer, audience, subject, expires at, and issued at claims in every identity token. It also requires that the issuer claim is an HTTPS URL, that the audience claim is always the OAuth client ID of the requesting application, and that the subject claim is always the user who authenticated. Identity tokens can be relatively short-lived, often with a lifetime of only a few minutes, just enough time for the token to reach the client application and to be validated. Beyond these core JOT claims, OpenID Connect defines some new claim types that facilitate further security checks and communicate how the user authenticated at the identity provider. This includes the auth time claim, which is when the user last verified their identity. If this is too far in the past, the client application could reject the token, asking the user to re-authenticate. This can be useful when the user has a long-lived single sign-on session at the identity provider. You then have the authentication method reference, which lists how the user proved their identity. In this case, they used a password and some form of multi-factor authentication. The client application will use this claim to decide if the user has authenticated to a good enough standard. For instance, your admin portal may require multi-factor authentication, while your help desk may just require a password. The authentication context class reference offers similar functionality grouping the method references into a known level of authentication. This means that a client application can just check that a minimum level of authentication was achieved, rather than knowing about every authentication method and how good each one is. In this example, the user authentication met the requirement for the Open Banking's Strong Customer Authentication Standard. The nonce claim is more protocol specific. The nonce is a no more than once value, a random value that was included in the initial authorization request made to the identity provider. By repeating this value back in the identity token, you allow the client application to verify that this identity token was created in response to the request that it made, and that the token was not stolen and injected into the application. It allows you to correlate the token to a request. And finally, you have the session ID, which refers to the single sign-on session at the identity provider. This is mainly used during single sign-out and not necessarily by the client application. Surprisingly, the identity part of an identity token is optional. While you can include identity claims such as name, preferred username, or email inside the identity token itself, a better approach is to use the user info endpoint. This is a special API endpoint defined as part of OpenID Connect that allows you to fetch identity data from the identity provider. Using this API instead of putting data in the token removes the risk of bloated tokens or leaking identity data to the browser or server logs. However, if you want to avoid the extra API call, then by all means, put identity claims in the identity token, but consider encrypting it first. To learn more about OpenID Connect's identity tokens, 
check out my article, Understanding Identity Tokens. Due to their stateless nature, jots have seen popularity as OAuth access tokens, especially in systems where you host the OAuth authorization server in a different location to the APIs it protects or that belong to a third party. Or even in high performance systems, where the ability to validate a token without the need for a call to a database or external service is vital. However, due to the flexibility of the JOT standards, it was often difficult to find an authorization server that used the same JOT format. They all use slightly different claims, treating some as required and other as optional, and often including their own custom claim types, despite trying to describe the same thing. For example, here are two JOT access tokens, taken from the documentation of some popular identity vendors. They contain almost the same information, but differ in claim types and format. To rectify this, the OAuth Working Group created a new standard that defines a common format for JSON web tokens when they are used as OAuth access tokens. This is RFC 9068 the JOT profile for OAuth access tokens. This profile uses the type header to show that the token is both an OAuth access token and a JOT. When using this profile, if you receive a JOT access token that does not have this media type, then the token should fail validation. This can prevent cross-JOT confusion, where a JOT for a different purpose is used at an API to gain unauthorized access. With this media type, there's no guessing. This is an OAuth access token, not an identity token or a token with a different purpose altogether. For the payload, much like with identity tokens, many of the core JOT claims are marked as required. This includes the issuer, audience, subject, expires at, issued at, and JOT ID. The other required claim is the client ID which corresponds to the OAuth client ID used by the application that requested the access token. For this profile, the subject claim could be the user who authorized access to the API. Or if no user was present, it could again be the client ID of the requesting application. Therefore, client IDs must not clash with user IDs. This profile can also include claims that describe how the user authenticated. These claims include when the user authenticated, to what level, and using what methods. These are the same claims defined by OpenID Connect for identity tokens, so I won't cover them again here, but they serve the same purpose, to help make authorization decisions. For example, if the user last authenticated six hours ago, you may want to deny access at the API level and ask that they re-authenticate. There are OAuth standards in the works that formalize how to achieve this. The token can also include what OAuth scopes the user consented to. If you're new to OAuth, scopes are specific levels of permissions or functionality within an API that the user can allow an application to access on their behalf. So for example, you could have something generic like read and write scopes or something very specific like a send email scope. Bizarrely, this profile requires that the value of the scope claim is a space delimited string, rather than an array of values. This profile also enforces the validation of these claims, which should be nothing new to you if you've been following along with this course. It also explicitly denies the use of unsigned tokens, which is always a good idea. To learn more about OAuth and access tokens, check out my other Pluralsight course, Getting Started with OAuth 2. Before we take a look at some JOT developer libraries, let's take a look at some tools that can be useful to anyone looking to debug or test JSON web tokens. Let's start with one of the most well-known tools, JOT.io. This website is a JOT decoding and validation tool. 
built and maintained by the identity vendor Auth0. So if we take a jot similar to the one we created earlier in the course and paste it into the debugger, you can see that the header and payload are automatically decoded and formatted for us. You can also get some useful hints about claim types and human readable date times. By default, the tool reports that the signature is invalid. But this is only because the tool does not know your public key. You can also paste your key into the debugger if you want to test signature validation. The tool supports various formats. Here I'm using a JSON web key that contains an ECDSA public key. If you're not a fan of Jot.io, alternatives I can recommend are Jot.ms, which is a much more lightweight website that is more aimed towards tokens issued by Azure Active Directory, or even the CyberChef tool from GCHQ. For token generation, I struggled to find a tool suitable for my needs. So I ended up creating my own. To create tokens, you need to use a private key something that should never be uploaded to some random dude's website, no matter how awesome their Pluralsight courses may be. As a result, this tool allows you to generate private keys for your algorithm of choice. You could then use this private key to generate test or sample tokens, perfect for including in unit tests or documentation. All of these tools use JavaScript running within your browser and it's assumed that no token data is uploaded to a server. However, that being said, you should never upload private or sensitive data to these websites. This includes tokens from production systems, private keys, or tokens containing personally identifiable information. If you need to debug sensitive data for any reason, I suggest looking at downloadable alternatives or building your own internal tooling. Now that you understand the JOT format and how to create and validate tokens, let's look at JOTs in action with a few developer libraries. For the rest of this module, you'll see JOT creation and validation in Python, JavaScript, and C Sharp, focusing on the JOTs they create and how they implement best practices with header and payload validation. You're welcome to follow along at home, but be aware that I have not designed these demos as coding tutorials. Instead, their purpose is to demonstrate the theory you have learned so far and the similarity of APIs across JOT libraries. As a result, these demos will not be maintained past this course's initial release. If you're looking for a JOT library in a different programming language or with specific features, I recommend starting with this list maintained by Auth0 on JOT.io. Let's start with the Python library authlib and create two scripts, one for jot creation and one for validation. Authlib is available on the Python package index, so remember to install it if you haven't already. I already have the library installed in this environment, so I'll skip this step. To start, let's import the library, bringing in authlib's jot functionality. We'll then need our private key. I have this stored as a JSON web key, which Authlib supports. This is a key suitable for elliptic curve cryptography, where ES256 is our signing algorithm. This uses short keys and short signatures, which means simpler demos. Next, we'll define the header. I'm just going to set the type and algorithm headers for now. Authlib will insert the key ID for me on jot creation. Then we have the payload. Here I'm going to define the issuer, audience, subject, expires at, and issued at. Everything a standard jot needs. For simple Unix timestamp creation, I'm using Python's time library, which I need to import here. With a header, a payload, and a key, we can create a JSON web token using authlib's encode method. Despite the method name, Encode does handle signature generation. Let's see what that gives us by printing out the generated token and running the script. 
there's our job done. If we decode our token, we can see our token header and payload, almost exactly like we defined it in the script. And if we bring across our public key, we can see that the signature is valid. Again, we need to import the library and then bring across our JSON web key, this time only containing the public key. This time, we'll also ask for the token to be passed into the script via the terminal. The first method we want to call is decode. This method will return the parsed payload of the token, but it won't validate the signature or the payload for us. To do that, we need to call the validate method, which will validate the signature and if the token has expired. But as you've seen throughout this course, we must also validate who issued the token and that the token is intended for us. So let's create some claims options that will allow us to do that. Setting the issuer and audience claims as required and defining the acceptable values for them. Now, if we pass that into the decode method and then call validate, we ensure that our token is valid. We can then prove this validation by changing the accepted audience claim, rerunning the script, and seeing that we get a token validation error. To see up to date usage of Authlib, check out its website or GitHub repository. Now let's take a look at a JavaScript library, simply called Jose. I really like this library as it implements almost all of the Jose standards without any dependency. As a result, it runs pretty much anywhere JavaScript can run. For this example, I'm just going to use Node.js to run some JavaScript as a simple script. Our first step is to install the Jose library, which I'm going to do via npm, and then bring the library into our script. Next is our private key, again a key for use with elliptic curve cryptography using the ES256 algorithm. We then want to parse this key into JSON, ready to pass into the Jose library. Jose can understand a variety of key formats, including JWK. So let's use import JWK to load that in. With the parse key, we can then call sign jot. This requires a payload, but since we're only using standard claims, I'm going to avoid typos and instead use some handy helper methods that the library provides rather than typing them in manually. So let's leave this empty and instead use those helper methods, setting our standard claims. We then call the sign method, passing in our parse key. This will generate our token, which I'm just going to log out into the console to complete our script. Let's run the script and see what we get. Decoding this token shows an almost identical token to the one Authlib did in Python. Even the claim ordering in the payload is the same, since we call the set methods in the same order. And if we bring our public key across, we can see that the signature is valid. Our validation script will be much the same, bringing in our jot library and also a library to read from the terminal so that we can pass in our jot after running our script. Again, we'll bring our public key as a JWK and parse that as JSON. Now, if we read our token from the terminal and parse the JSON web key, we can use the jot verify method. Unlike your typical decode method, this will automatically validate the token signature and payload, checking that the token has not expired. But we can again have the library validate the standard claims for us by requiring a specific token issuer and audience. To complete the script, let's log out the result and give this a run. Here we can see that the token is valid and the parsed header and payload. And like before, just to prove claim validation, if we change our expected audience to something different, we can see that validation failed due to an invalid audience claim. To learn more about the Jose library and to see up-to-date usage, check out its source code and documentation on GitHub. To finish off, let's look at a C-sharp library 
provided by Microsoft. This is the library that backs ASP.NET Core's Jot Authentication middleware. And personally, I really like this library as everything is strongly typed and payload validation is on by default. You really have to go out of your way to disable things like issuer and audience validation. And I like that approach. As with the other demos, let's start by bringing in the library from a package manager. This time we're using NuGet. We can then add our using statements for the parts of the library we need and import our elliptic curve private key. We then need a JSON web token handler and we want to call its create token method. This method has overloads where you can pass in a header and a payload that you have already created, but a better option is to use a security descriptor. This will allow us to describe the token, allowing the Jot library to build it for us. Passing in our usual values for the payload, we then need to provide our signing key. Let's log the resulting token and give this a run. If we decode the token, we can see it's in a slightly different format than the other libraries. Since we didn't dictate the header and payload, the Jot library instead decided the order of our claims in the payload. It all means the same things, it's just in a different order. Again, if we bring in our public key, we can see that the signature is valid. Validation starts off much the same. Let's bring in our using statements, our public key, and read the token from the terminal. Let's new up a handler again, this time calling its validate token method. We'll pass it the token and some token validation parameters. By default, this library will validate the signature and payload, including the issuer and audience claims. If the token doesn't have those claims, or if you don't provide it with expected values, then this library will return a validation error. It makes you go out of your way to disable these core claim checks. Let's pass in our expected issuer and audience values and our public key for signature validation. We'll let the library handle the rest. This method returns a validation result, which includes the parse claims and details about the token itself. But for this demo, let's just write out if the token is valid or not. Let's run the demo, pass in our token, and see if we get a success result. And like the other demos, let's prove those payload checks are happening by changing the expected audience, which now gives us a validation failure. You can learn more about Microsoft's identity model library by viewing their source code on GitHub or checking out the tutorials on my website. In this module, you learned how to create a JSON web token, creating standardized header and payload objects, encoding them with base64 URL, and preparing them for signing, which we'll see in greater detail in the next module. You then saw how the recipient would validate that token, taking care to validate the incoming header and payload to prove that the token was sent from a legitimate token issuer, and that the signature was valid and in the format you expected. You then saw some practical use cases of JOTs, where OpenID Connect identity tokens use JOTs and standardized claims to tell an application how a user authenticated, and an OAuth profile that normalizes common OAuth JOT claims. You saw some online validation tools, such as AuthZero's JOT validation website, and a JOT creation tool on my website. While I consider both websites somewhat trustworthy, don't be tempted to upload sensitive or production data to them. And finally, you saw some Jot libraries in various programming languages. While these all had slightly different designs, they all exposed common Jot functionality, validated signatures and expiry by default, and advocated the use of standard Jot claims, including the validation steps you saw detailed in this module. Next up is a deep dive into JSON web signatures, where you'll learn more about digital signatures and how to choose the best signing algorithm.
Hi everyone, I'm Scott Brady and welcome to the JSON Web Signatures in-depth module of the Jot Fundamentals course on Pluralsight. In this module, you'll learn the basics of digital signatures and signing keys, hopefully clearing up any doubts you have about what signatures achieve, how you generate them, and the differences between keys and certificates. You'll then see how JSON web algorithms and JSON web signature standards define support for various signing algorithms, how to identify them, and some best practices on validating keys and algorithms before you even think about the signature itself. You'll then get an overview of the most common signing algorithms available to you in the Jot ecosystem. Don't worry, we won't go into too much detail about cryptography, but these sections will give you an understanding of which algorithm to choose, when presented with a choice, and why you might prefer one over the other. This overview will include topics such as the algorithms general security and history, signature and key length, and their popularity in Jot libraries and identity systems. Let's make a start with a deeper look at digital signatures. Digital signatures allow you to verify that no one has tampered with your data and that someone you trust created it. You achieve this using public key cryptography, where you use a private key to generate the signature and then a corresponding public key to verify it. This means that many people can verify the signature, but only one can create it. This assurance is vital to Jot security and means that digital signatures provide integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation since the verifier can prove who created the signature due to the private nature of the private key. In the case of JOTs, signatures are not created using the plain text JOT itself, but rather a hash of the JOT. This is necessary for the signing algorithm to handle the arbitrary size of JSON web tokens. Often, public key cryptography is too inefficient to sign large amounts of data, so ensuring that the data is a known size offers performance benefits and allows you to use signing algorithms that would otherwise be unable to support JOTs. Depending on your signing algorithm, it can also provide some security benefits. We'll cover what hashing algorithms to use later in this module. So far, we've only talked about public and private keys, but what do these look like? These keys can be passed around as the plain text key itself. Here you have a key suitable for elliptic curve cryptography stored as a JSON web key. This is simply the private and public key parameters as their raw bytes, base64 URL encoded. Nothing else is provided apart from what to use the key for and what elliptic curve. For JOTs, this is absolutely fine to use since you should agree on the keys and algorithms ahead of time. But if you need further validation steps, then you could use an X509 certificate instead. Storing the public key in an X509 certificate allows you to bind it to an identity and further information about the key itself. This can include data about who created the key and when it expires. You can also sign a certificate using your organization's trusted certificate authority. This can be useful if you want to prove the key's validity, that your organization created it. Otherwise, a certificate can be self-signed and used only to transmit data such as key expiry. These certificates do not need to be signed by a certificate authority, like a certificate used for HTTPS traffic. They have a very different use case. Before we look at some signature algorithms, let's first clarify what we mean by algorithm values such as RS-256. As a general rule of thumb, you can break down an algorithm such as RS-256 into two parts, the signature algorithm family and the hashing algorithm. In this case, RS means that RSA is the signature algorithm, and 256 means that SHA-256 is the hashing algorithm. These values are part of the JSON web algorithm standard 
and you typically use them for algorithm headers in JSON Web Tokens and in JSON Web Keys. Most signing algorithms have variants for SHA-256, SHA-384, and SHA-512. Sometimes you can even have something like RS1, which uses SHA-1. Throughout this module, you'll see various signing algorithms, including a discussion on how secure and popular they are. But what hashing algorithm should you use? SHA-256, 384, and 512 are all variations of the same hashing algorithm family, SHA-2. As a rule of thumb, the number in the algorithm refers to the size of the hash the algorithm will generate. For example, SHA-256 will produce a 256-bit hash, while SHA-512 will produce a 512-bit hash. The level of security each one gives you is 50% of their output size. So SHA-256 will provide you with 128 bits of security, and SHA-512 will provide you with 256 bits of security. 128-bit security means that an attacker has to generate 2 to the power of 128 hashes before they start finding collisions. This is our target level of security. You'll not need anything better than SHA-256 anytime soon, and you'll find that it is the most common hashing algorithm used for JOTs. Just don't use SHA-1. As I've mentioned before, you should only treat header parameters such as key ID and algorithm as hints. You must always validate that the key the token is asking you to use makes sense in this scenario. So, during your validation process, ask yourself, is this key allowed to be used for this algorithm? As the token validator, you can validate this by storing each public key against the algorithm you can use it with. If you have many keys for a single algorithm, then you can use the key ID to understand which one to use. If the key ID and the algorithm do not match what you expect, then someone is up to no good. If you're using an X509 certificate, you can validate this using the X509 certificate thumbprint instead of the key ID. This can either use the X5T header for the legacy SHA-1 thumbprint or the SHA-256 version. However, there is one algorithm value you should never accept, the algorithm of none. This algorithm means that the JOT does not have a signature and therefore that you should not trust it. Do not allow unsigned JOTs in your system. You'll see some of the fun attacks on JOTs due to this algorithm in the best practices module. For now, let's focus on actual signing algorithms. Let's start with by far the most common signing algorithm, RSA. In this case, we're talking about RSA, SSA, PKCS1 v1.5. That's a bit of a mouthful for me, so for now let's just call it RSA as an abbreviation. RSA uses the prefix RS for its algorithm parameter and has variations for all versions of SHA-2. JOTs signed with RSA have a deterministic signature, meaning that the same JOT header and payload signed using the same key will always generate the same signature value. The signature length depends on the length of the key itself, with the JWA standard defining a minimum key length of 2048 bits. However, for modern systems, I would recommend a minimum of 3072. So with a key length of 3072 bits, you generate a signature that's also 3072 bits in length. In my experience, RS-256 has historically been the default for most JOT implementations, with many identity vendors offering this signature algorithm as their only option. As a result, it's hard to find a system that can't support JOTs signed with RS-256. And this historical popularity can be attributed to RS-256 being the only digital signature algorithm marked as recommended in the original JWS standard. While this style of RSA is no longer safe for encryption, it is still suitable for digital signatures. 
assuming the implementation adheres to standards. That being said, when discussing attacks around the RSA PKCS1 encryption and signature standards, the author of Real World Cryptography shares an interesting statistic, showing that many implementations of RSA signatures are still vulnerable to some of these older attacks. Since the attacks are against signature validation, you will have to be confident that all recipients who validate your jots are using a library that is not vulnerable to such attacks. That may not be easy if you are dealing with many third parties. So while RSA has been around for a long time, these days you should generally prefer the newer RSA PSS, which we'll take a look at shortly. That's not to say this style of RSA is broken, but rather that RSA PSS simply has desirable features that this does not. In fact, RFC 8017 now considers RSA PSS a requirement when using RSA for signing. The UK's open banking standards also take this approach, disallowing JOT algorithms such as RS256. So let's take a look at the preferred version of RSA, RSA PSS. RSA PSS uses the prefix PS for its algorithm parameter, and again has variations for all versions of SHA-2. RSA PSS is the probabilistic version of RSA, meaning that the same JOT header and payload, when signed with the same key, will generate a different signature each time. Unlike other algorithms, this is probabilistic in a good way. While it does use a random value during signature generation, the random value is not critical to the security of the signature. That means it's much simpler to implement and therefore harder to get wrong. If you want to use an RSA key, then it's recommended that you use RSA PSS over the PKCS1 version. But luckily you can use an RSA key for either signature scheme. Signature length is also identical between the two. As I mentioned earlier, the UK's Open Banking and OpenID Connect's financial grade API require support for PS256. In fact, they initially mandated that you can only use PS256, but later they opened up to ES256, which we'll take a look at next. Next up are Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithms, or ECDSA. In the case of elliptic curve digital signatures, the number in ES256 that refers to the hashing algorithm also relates to the curve it uses. So ES256 uses P256 and ES384 uses P384. But there is one odd one out, which is ES512. So that isn't a typo, it uses SHA512, but the curve 521. Believe it or not, many libraries have typoed this in the past. Elliptic curve cryptography is generally much harder to crack than RSA. Or maybe it's just that we've got really good at breaking RSA. But as a result, ECDSA can use much shorter keys than RSA, along with much shorter signatures. A short elliptic curve key of around 256 bits provides the same security as a 3072-bit RSA key. However, JOTs signed with ECDSA have a probabilistic signature, meaning that the same JOT header and payload will always generate a different signature. But unfortunately, ECDSA is probabilistic in a bad way, where random value generation is vital to the security of the signature and the key. ECDSA uses a random nonce, and no more than once, that is a value generated per signature. Failure to prevent nonce reuse makes the private key easily recoverable, and this has been seen in the wild with both Sony's PlayStation 3 and Bitcoin. With the PlayStation 3, the private key was recovered due to a static nonce, and with Bitcoin, Android's users were affected due to a bug in Java's secure random class on Android. This issue is only present on signature generation, which is arguably easier to manage with JOTs 
due to there likely being a single token issuer, unlike with RSA, where the vulnerability sat with the many token validators. Thankfully, the issuer can mitigate these concerns by using the deterministic variant of ECDSA, specified in RFC 6979. However, that being said, recent vulnerabilities have shown that some libraries fail to validate incoming signatures correctly, allowing for signature validation to be bypassed. I recommend you confirm the use of deterministic ECDSA by a JOT library before using it for signing tokens with these algorithms and ensure that your JOT library is at least using an up-to-date ECDSA implementation. ECDSA is gaining popularity, but seems to be generally frowned upon by cryptographers due to how elliptic curve cryptography was implemented, with real concerns about implementation difficulty due to the use of random values. If random values are required for the security of a probabilistic signature, then you should probably prefer an alternative method. So while ECDSA has a better reputation than RSA, cryptographers are still advocating the use of EDDSA, which we'll see next. Before we do that, I want to briefly mention E256K, a popular alternative to the curves you've seen previously that were initially defined by NIST. ES256K instead uses a different kind of curve. These curves are a few bits weaker than the NIST curves, but if you have concerns about using cryptography defined by the NSA, then this curve offers an alternative. You can find usages of these curves in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and FIDO2. However, if you want to use a non-NIST curve, I would instead recommend the final algorithm we'd be covering instead, EDDSA. The final digital signing algorithm we'll cover are Edwards Curve Digital Signature Algorithms, or EDDSA. EDDSA breaks the trend of the previous algorithms and uses a single algorithm value, EDDSA. While EDDSA does apply to multiple curves just like ECDSA, it makes use of the best practices we've previously discussed by relying on the curve defined by a pre-agreed key, such as this JSON web key. This forces the modern behavior of using the curve assigned to the key instead of the JOT header, eliminating various attacks based on the algorithm header. EDDSA is a form of elliptic curve cryptography that takes advantage of twisted Edwards curves. It's a variant of Schnorr's signature algorithm rather than the traditional DSA, that's some cool buzzwords, but what it means to us as JOT creators and validators is that EDDSA is fast at both signing and validation, it creates short signatures, and its modern design sidesteps a whole class of security vulnerabilities. It also creates deterministic signatures, which is deterministic in a good way. While EDDSA uses random values, it only does so during private key creation. Jose supports two variants of EDDSA, namely for the curves ED25519 and ED448. This is the signing algorithm typically recommended by cryptographers and used by many of the critics of JSON web tokens. While support for EDDSA in JOT libraries is still pretty patchy, expect to see more of this algorithm soon. Up until now, every algorithm you've seen creates digital signatures using asymmetric cryptography, where only a single entity can create a signature. However, the original JOT standard defines an alternative approach that uses hash-based message authentication codes, otherwise known as HMACs. With HMAC, you can use a shared secret and a hash function to create a message authentication code with the hashing algorithm typically being one of the SHA-2 variants. Unlike digital signatures where only one party knows the private key, Max use symmetric cryptography, where the same key is used to both create and validate the JOT signature. As a result, all parties must know the same key. However, this also means that anyone with the key can create valid tokens.
This means that HMAC allows the verifier to prove that the data has not been tampered with and that the creator knew the secret key. But it does not provide any non repudiation since you cannot prove who created the token. It could have been anyone with the secret. As a result, using HMAC for JOT signing is seen as something of an anti pattern with distributed systems and protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect. There is simply no way for the verifier to prove who created the token. In the rare event that only one entity issues and validates the tokens, you could consider using symmetric cryptography such as HS256. However, in my opinion, if you find yourself in this position, then I don't think JOTs are the right solution for you. If the same entity is both reading and writing, then what is the requirement for round tripping structured plain text data in a JOT? In this case, I recommend storing the data in a database and passing around the reference, or using an encrypted JOT, or even an alternative token format, where only you can read the data. In this module, you learned how digital signatures work and how they allow you to verify that a message has not been tampered with and that it was created by a known party. You also saw how signing keys can be used on their own or as part of a certificate to bind it to an identity and further information. You learned how JWA defines algorithms, what they mean, and how you should always validate the various algorithm and key related headers. You also saw an overview of the most popular signing algorithms in the JOT ecosystem and how EDDSA should be your preferred signing algorithm, with ECDSA or RSA PSS being your second choice. It's not controversial to say that RSA is slowly on its way out, so offering a strong implementation of ECDSA is a good alternative, but ideally you'll want to move to EDDSA when possible. And finally, you saw that a HMAC doesn't provide the same security as a digital signature, and how its use really doesn't make sense for a distributed system or with protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect. To learn more about the signing algorithms available to you in JSON Web Tokens, check out the IANA registry, which includes a list of all registered algorithms, including a link to their definition in JWA or newer standards. Hi, my name is Scott Brady, and welcome to the JSON Web Encryption In-Depth module of the JOT Fundamentals course on Pluralsight. In this module, you'll learn the basics of encryption, both symmetric and asymmetric, and how they can work together to provide you with the benefits of both. You'll then see tokens encrypted using JWE, what they look like, how to identify them, and how they provide both confidentiality and integrity thanks to authenticated encryption. You'd also see how to combine both token encryption with token signing so that you can use them with protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect. You'd also see when to encrypt your JOTs and how to choose the best encryption algorithm when presented with multiple choices. Let's make a start. Encryption provides you with confidentiality. It is the process of taking a message and converting it into ciphertext that only the intended recipient can read. You achieve this using keys to protect and unprotect the message, encrypting the plain text into ciphertext and decrypting it back into plain text. This is symmetric encryption, where you use the same key to both encrypt and decrypt the message. This means that both parties must know the encryption key, which, as you saw with symmetric cryptography for signatures, often isn't the best idea for zero trust or distributed architectures. Let's see how asymmetric cryptography can help us here. Previously, when signing tokens with asymmetric cryptography, you used a private key to create a signature and a public key to verify it. This meant that only one person could create tokens, but many people could validate them. With asymmetric encryption, you want to achieve the opposite. You want many people to be able to encrypt the data, but only one to decrypt it. 
As a result, asymmetric encryption allows many people to encrypt using the public key and only one to decrypt using the private key. However, asymmetric encryption is pretty slow and not the best idea for encrypting something like a jot, which could be relatively large. As a result, JSON web encryption uses asymmetric encryption in combination with the much faster symmetric encryption. Let's see how that works. First, you start off with your plain text message. You then generate a symmetric key and encrypt the message using symmetric encryption. This creates your ciphertext. You then encrypt the encryption key itself using your asymmetric encryption and your public key. This encrypted key can be sent to the recipient alongside the ciphertext. You'll see the exact format of this in JWE shortly. Once the recipient receives the encrypted key and the ciphertext, they can decrypt the symmetric key using asymmetric encryption and their private key, which they can then use to decrypt the ciphertext, revealing the original plain text. This hybrid approach means that slow asymmetric encryption is only ever used to encrypt a fixed size, relatively small key, while you use the much faster encryption to encrypt the message, which could be of any size. To maintain the system security, a fresh symmetric key is used for each message. They are never reused. We'll discuss exactly what algorithms to use shortly, but at a high level, your asymmetric encryption algorithm will probably be something like RSA, while your symmetric encryption algorithm will be a form of AES. Now that you have a base understanding of asymmetric encryption, let's take a look at the JWE format. An encrypted JSON web token is easily distinguishable from a signed JSON web token, as it has five distinct sections rather than the usual three. These are the protected header, the encrypted key, the initialization vector, the ciphertext itself, and an authentication tag. The protected header is roughly the same as your usual JWT header. However, in this case, it describes how the token was encrypted. The algorithm header is the asymmetric encryption algorithm used to encrypt the encryption key. And the encryption algorithm header is the symmetric encryption algorithm used to create the ciphertext. In this case, the key ID describes the public key used to encrypt the symmetric key. The type is still JWT, the same default as any other JWT. However, JWE can also include a content type. The content type is the kind of data the message is, the plain text behind the ciphertext. In this case, if you decrypt the data, you'll find another JSON web token. That would be what's called a nested JWT, which we'll see more on shortly. If that were the end of it, this header would be unprotected. It could be tampered with or even replaced by an attacker, and the recipient would have no way of knowing. To solve this, JWE requires the use of authenticated encryption. Authenticated encryption provides not only confidentiality, but also an integrity check, proving that no one has tampered with the ciphertext. Authenticated encryption not only defends against a whole class of attacks against encryption algorithms, but it also allows you to protect additional data. This additional authenticated data is data you want to protect, but do not want to encrypt. The JWE header is a perfect example of this. You need the recipient to be able to read it so that they know how to decrypt and validate the token, but you also need to ensure no one modifies it. Using authenticated encryption produces not only the ciphertext for the message, but also an authentication tag, which is used to validate the integrity of the ciphertext and the additional authenticated data. You'll see this tag again shortly. The next section is the content encryption key. This is the symmetric key that you encrypted using your asymmetric encryption key. This key is unique to this message. It is never reused. You then have the initialization vector, 
a value used during symmetric encryption. This value is used during encryption alongside the plain text to ensure that the resulting ciphertext is sufficiently randomized. There is a lot more to it than that, but for the sake of learning about JWE, knowing that this is a random value used during encryption is enough to move forward. If your symmetric encryption algorithm does not use an initialization vector, then this section would be empty. Next up is the ciphertext itself. This is your confidential message, encrypted using symmetric encryption. This was encrypted using the content encryption key and initialization vector included in the token, alongside the header as the additional authenticated data. And finally, you have the authentication tag, the value generated when using authenticated encryption and used to validate the integrity of the ciphertext and the additional authenticated data. If your symmetric encryption algorithm does not produce an authentication tag, then this section is again empty. Okay, so what about the message itself? What data does an encrypted JWT contain? The JWE standard allows you to encrypt any arbitrary payload, such as a simple string of characters or a JSON object. But let's think back to our earlier use cases of API authorization and information transfer. If your API accepts a JWE, you know that no one else was able to read the data, that no one has tampered with it, and that it was encrypted with your public key. But just because someone has encrypted a token using your public key doesn't mean you can trust them or the token. So how do you prove who created the token? With JWS, while you didn't get confidentiality, you could at least verify that a trusted party created the token. So how do we get the benefits of both JWE and JWS? This brings us to nested JOTs, where the encrypted payload of a JWE is yet another JOT, this time signed with JWS. By including a signed JOT in the JWE, you prove that the token was created by a trusted issuer and that it was confidential between the sender and the recipient. You gain the benefits of both JWE and JWS. Now you must treat this nested JOT like any other token you receive. You must always validate it, including its signature and its payload. Never ever allow unprotected nested JOTs. Nested JOTs are optional in the JOT standard. However, many JOT libraries I have used in the past assume that an encrypted JOT will always contain a nested JOT. JSON web encryption adds confidentiality to your tokens, but do you always need that? While encrypted by default is often a good policy to take, for the JOT use case, I think it depends on the type of data you are storing in your tokens and where you use them. The need for token encryption becomes obvious if you store private data in your tokens, such as personally identifiable information. You do not want this data visible to unauthorized systems. In some cases, you may not even want it visible to the end user. JWE can also be a really good use case when using an identity vendor who always puts end user identity data in their OpenID Connect ID tokens. If this token passes via the browser, which it would have to for single sign out, then you are exposing sensitive data. By encrypting the identity token, you protect the data and ensure only the client application can read it. Encrypting your tokens can also be helpful when you know the token will pass through multiple systems before reaching the intended recipient. For example, when a third party is terminating TLS before the token reaches the application. In this case, JWE will prevent other parties from reading the token. While encrypted by default is often a good security posture, remember that it significantly increases the number of keys you need to manage. For example, with OAuth, 
the authorization server must know the public key of every API. And with OpenID Connect, the authorization server must know the public key of every client application. Combine this with key management and rotation policies, and JWE can become complex to maintain very quickly. By far the most common algorithms for encryption are RSA and AES. But not all implementation of these algorithms are suitable for use with JWE. Let's take a look at what encryption algorithms you should use and which ones to avoid. For asymmetric encryption using RSA, as a general rule of thumb, you should use a form of RSA AES OAEP, which stands for Optimal Asymmetric Encryption Padding. This is the secure version of RSA for encryption and must be used over RSA ES PKCS1 V15, which is the broken version of RSA for encryption. By default, RSA OAEP for JWE will make use of SHA-1. While SHA-1 is an insecure hashing algorithm, this encryption algorithm does not rely on the hashing algorithm for security, making these defaults acceptable. If you wish to avoid the use of SHA-1 altogether, then alternatives supporting other hashing algorithms are available. Besides asymmetric encryption with RSA, you can also use symmetric encryption for key wrapping. Using symmetric encryption this way means that you still use a content encryption key shared in the JWE, but you instead encrypt that key using a symmetric encryption algorithm such as AES. In the JWT world, this is not as popular as asymmetric encryption, and it does not have the benefits of public key cryptography that you saw earlier. The other asymmetric algorithm for JWE uses ephemeral keys and elliptic curve cryptography. While this is preferable to RSA, it is unfortunately not as widespread in the JWT ecosystem. In fact, many of the major cloud identity vendors do not support JWE, let alone these key wrapping techniques. For symmetric encryption, you'll typically be using a form of AES. You've already seen the need to use authenticated encryption to maintain the integrity of the JWE header. However, not all modes of AES support authenticated encryption, nor are they all as good as each other. AES CBC is one of the most widespread modes of AES, but on its own, it does not provide authenticated encryption. That's why Jose only allows AES CBC in combination with an HMAC to provide authenticated encryption. A better alternative is to use AES GCM, which provides authenticated encryption out of the box. While many people prefer to use AES 256, AES 128 is safe enough to use. It provides the minimum of 128 bit security, and assuming you use an appropriately random encryption key, it is not feasible to crack. However, AES-256 does provide greater security and would not be broken by quantum computing if that ever becomes a threat. Just remember that your key wrapping algorithm and your content encryption algorithm must provide the same level of security. There are better encryption algorithms out there, such as XCHA-CHA-20 Poly-1305, but unfortunately none are registered for use with JOTS. For the best balance of security and widespread support, I recommend using RSA for asymmetric encryption and AES GCM for symmetric encryption. However, I do recommend investigating if alternatives can be supported, such as ECDHES, the alternative to RSA that I mentioned earlier. In this module, you've seen how encryption provides you with confidentiality and how to combine symmetric and asymmetric encryption algorithms in order to take advantage of the speed of symmetric encryption and the benefits of public key cryptography. You've learned the basics of JSON web encryption, understanding the unique structure of an encrypted JWT, its requirement for authenticated encryption to protect the token header, 
and how using nested jots can give you the best of both JWE and JWS in one token, adding a layer of confidentiality to your signed tokens. You've also seen when to use encryption and how it can protect PII from prying eyes or even unintentional third party access. You've also had some background on encryption algorithms, which ones are available to you for use with JOTS, and how if a vendor supports JWE, it will most likely be using RSA and AES due to their popularity and widespread support. Okay, that's enough encryption for now. Next up is a deep dive into JOT security best practices. Hi, I'm Scott Brady and welcome to the JOT security best practices module of the JOT fundamentals course on Pluralsight. In this module, you will learn why you should always rely on existing relationships rather than JOT headers alone and see some of the attacks on the JOT algorithm header that take advantage of the cryptographic agility of JSON web tokens. We'll then recap why using standardized claim types is important for interoperability and security. You'll then learn some more about token revocation. While you've already seen that JOTs are not designed for revocation, you will learn how to overcome this with patterns for implementing individual token revocation and break the glass style global revocation. You'll then learn some techniques where a JOT can be constrained to a single sender, thanks to emerging proof of possession standards from the OAuth Working Group. And finally, you'll see some alternative approaches to JSON web tokens, from competing token standards to simply not using tokens at all. Let's make a start. With JSON web tokens, you must always validate the algorithm and header values, treating them as hints rather than instructions. I've mentioned this in almost every module, and that's for good reason. Failure to handle these headers properly is the most exploited and criticized feature of the Jose standards. Let's take a look at why these headers exist, how they get exploited, and how to defend against the attacks that target them. JOTs are designed for cryptographic agility, meaning that the JOT format can support multiple cryptographic algorithms at the same time and support new ones in the future without the need to change every existing JOT implementation out there. To support this agility, JOTs use the algorithm header to tell the recipient what algorithm was used to sign the token. Transport layer security uses a similar approach, where initial handshakes agree on the best cipher suite supported by both the requesting party and the target web server. However, design flaws in JOT libraries have allowed this agility to be exploited, just like with TLS. While the token's signature protects the header, nothing stops the attacker from modifying the signature so that they can then change the header and, as a result, the payload. For example, if your JOT validation library is not following best practices, then changing the header's algorithm to none and simply deleting the signature would give you a valid token that the library would accept. This might seem obvious to defend against, to simply disallow the algorithm value of none, but even large vendors such as All Zero still face vulnerabilities due to this feature of the JOT standards. In the most recent instance, different casing allowed their unsigned token check to be bypassed. In fact, this is such a common issue, there is now a website dedicated to tracking vulnerabilities caused by this attack. Other downgrade attacks are possible, where an attacker can change the signing algorithm to a symmetric signing algorithm in an attempt to make the victim use the shared public key as a secret symmetric key. For example, both parties know an RSA public key. So the attacker signs a token with HS256 using the shared RSA public key as the secret key. The victim sees the valid key ID header but does not validate what algorithm they should use the key with 
Therefore, this is a valid token to them. It can be easy to scoff at these exploits and think it will never happen to you or the Jot library you use. But these issues have caused too many vulnerabilities to ignore. As a result, some developers choose to use alternative token formats, some of which you'll see later in this module. But Jots are just too popular, and if you want interoperability, you will need to support them. So how do you use them securely? And what do you need to test for? Well, as you've seen throughout this course, after checking that you support the algorithm and know the key, my main recommendation is to always ask, does this key make sense for this algorithm? And if you support multiple token issuers, check that the key belongs to that token's issuer. As the token validator, Rejecting any token that does not pass these checks will mitigate many of the vulnerabilities caused by Jose's cryptographic agility. The other headers to look out for handle embedded keys and key lookup. Unless you have an algorithm that uses ephemeral keys or some sort of key agreement, then you should never accept keys embedded in a JOT header. Keys must be agreed upon ahead of time in a secure manner. A key in the JOT header could have been put there by anyone. You cannot trust it. In the absence of a key ID header, then maybe you could use this key as a hint, checking to see if you already know the same key, but that's about it. You should also avoid following random URLs in the JOT header, such as the JKU and X5U values. These are the JOT telling you where to retrieve some keys so that you can validate its signature. But again, this is easy for an attacker to exploit. They could either point you to an endpoint hosting their own keys, or even use it to trigger a server-side request forgery attack. If you need to use these headers for any reason, consider validating them against a list of allowed URLs. But safer still, is to only ever use pre-agreed keys loaded into your system before you receive a token. You've already seen these claims throughout this course. I again want to reiterate that the core claims defined in the JOT standard really aren't optional and should be included in every JOT, no matter your use case. These are the token issuer, so that you can validate who created the token, the token audience, to validate who the token is intended for, the subject, so that you know who the token represents, and the expired at and issued at claims, so that you can validate token lifetime. While Jot ID is gaining some popularity, this is the one standard claim I wouldn't be upset with you for not using. If you do not check these claims, you will be accepting tokens intended for a different application, expired tokens, or possibly even tokens that are as old as the JOT standards themselves. Pretty much every decent JOT library will provide you with ways to automatically require and validate these claims, with many doing so out of the box. Standard claim validation is a key part of JOT security and is now enforced by protocols such as OAuth and OpenID Connect, despite the original JOT standard's permissive nature. If you have custom claims, I recommend using the type header to enforce custom validation rules, just as you saw with OAuth's JOT profile for access tokens. I've seen many JOT implementations use their own custom versions of standardized claims, or even use a different value type for the claim. Try to avoid this, as it only makes interoperability harder and prevents you from taking advantage of out-of-the-box functionality in JOT libraries. For this reason, I recommend always checking the JOT registry before creating your own claim type, just in case. As you've seen throughout this course, an individual token is valid until its expires at claim is in the past.
This claim allows you to create tokens that can access a protected resource or to attest to some data being true for a set amount of time. If you need to invalidate a token, you must inform the token verifier, as they are the only ones who can enforce this. As you saw earlier in this course, JOTs are not designed for instant revocation or one-time use. While it is something you can implement, I would recommend that you instead consider a different token solution if this is your primary use case. However, if you are already using JOTs, or if you really want to use them in this manner, let's take a look at some techniques available to you and what to do if everything goes wrong and you need to invalidate all of your tokens. Let's start with block lists. These are useful when you need to prevent a JOT from being used. For example, maybe you ignored best practices and put user permissions into them, and now those permissions need to be revoked. Or maybe the token has been stolen and in the hands of a malicious party. To use a block list, you add the revoked tokens, JOT ID, to a store of disallowed tokens. If you aren't using JOT IDs, then an alternative could be to store the hash of a token. Each time you validate a token, you then need to check to see if the token is present in the block list. If the token is in the list, you deny the request. This lookup is an extra step that may add some latency to your requests. And depending on your architecture, you may need to maintain a block list for each token verifier or a central store for all of them to share. An alternative is to make use of OAuth's introspection endpoint that allows you to send a token to your OAuth authorization server to find out if it is valid. This can abstract away your block list, allowing it to be enforced by a single source of truth. But at this point, you should start to question what advantages JOTs are giving you over the opaque reference token approach you saw earlier in this course. Since you are always checking a store, what benefits are you gaining from the stateless nature of JOTs? I think this is always worth discussing when considering jots and revocation patterns. Next, let's take a look at what you can do when everything goes wrong, when you need to invalidate every single JSON web token you have created. This could happen due to a security incident where you can no longer trust that a token has not been stolen or even created by a malicious party. For example, if an attacker has your private key, they could start creating their own jots, indistinguishable from your own. As the token issuer, the quickest way to handle this is to roll your signing key. You immediately stop creating tokens with the old key and start creating new tokens with the new key. The token verifiers would need to be aware of this change too. They need to delete the existing public key and load in the new one. Once they do that, they will no longer accept tokens signed with the compromised keys and start accepting tokens signed using the new one. This doesn't need to cause any downtime for the token issuer or the verifier. If you are publicizing your keys in a metadata document, the token validator can automatically download your new public key and start accepting your uncompromised tokens. One thing I want to briefly cover is proof of possession. So far throughout this course, we have only discussed using JOTs as bearer tokens, where anyone with the token can use it without further validation. Only possession of the token is required to use it. This is good news for attackers, as they can use the stolen tokens with minimal effort. Wouldn't it be better if there was a way to prove that you are allowed to use the token? That you are the party the token was issued to, and that it is not being used by a malicious party? Techniques that allow you to do this are called proof of possession. Unfortunately, proof of possession has historically been very hard to implement correctly and in a way that works for various application types, such as mobile devices, 
and single page apps running in the browser. However, at the time of recording, there are two emerging methods from the OAuth working group that look very promising, both of which work very well with Jots. The first method takes advantage of mutual TLS and is defined in RFC 8705. This standard defines a method of authenticating client applications using MTLS. It allows the client application to use a certificate and MTLS to verify its identity at the token endpoint, which in a traditional web application with a backend server happens as part of a server to server API call. While this can be a useful mechanism for certificate based client authentication, what is really interesting is that the resulting access token can be bound to that client certificate. When this confirmation method claim is present, the access token is only valid when used with an MTLS connection with this client certificate. This means that only someone with the client certificate can use the access token. However, the problem with this approach is that it only really works for application types that can handle MTLS and automatically load in client certificates. Some applications will not be able to do this, and some will require user interaction. For example, a browser-based single-page application would trigger an operating system selection box asking the user to choose a client certificate to use for authentication. That's really not a great user experience. The other method is demonstrating proof of possession at the application layer, which I'll abbreviate to DPOP. DPOP aims to provide a proof of possession mechanism that works for all application types. It again adds an extra layer to the OAuth token request, but this time it involves sending a JSON web token as a security proof. This jot is signed by a private key of the client application's choosing and contains the corresponding public key, along with a jot ID and details about the request it is making. This prevents the proof from being reused. The authorization server will then bind the resulting access token to the key that generated the proof. When this access token is used against a protected resource, it must be sent alongside another DPOP proof. This proof uses the same format as the previous one, but this time it proves to the token validator that they know the key and can therefore use the access token. With DPOP, the private key does not need to be long-lived. In fact, it could use a new key per token per browser session. This means that any kind of application can use DPOP, even a single page browser application that cannot keep a secret. By far the most common criticism of JOTS and the JOSE standards is their use of cryptographic agility. The ability for the token to tell the verifier how it was signed or encrypted and therefore how it should be verified. In my opinion, the Jose standards try to cover too many use cases and are way too permissive as a result. This issue can be mitigated by only using JOTS with restricted profiles such as the access token profile, only using them with standardized protocols and by following the JOT best practices detailed throughout this course and RFC 8725. However, the weaknesses in the core standards have been exploited too often to ignore or to be surprised that people might want to use something else. So let's take a look at some alternative token formats and what problems they solve. Let's start with the platform agnostic security token known as Passetto, which offers a decent alternative to signed and encrypted JOTS. Passetto was created in direct response to its author's concerns with JOTS and the various JOSE standards. And while JOTS and Passetto's are conceptually similar, Passetto does not implement cryptographic agility. Instead, it replaces it with a versioning system. Passetto uses a slightly different format using a version, a purpose, a payload, and an optional footer. 
any signatures or authentication tags are concatenated onto the payload itself. If we decode the payload, it is still a UTF-8 JSON payload. However, it does use a different format for date times. Funnily enough, it also includes a JTI, a JOT ID. This token format uses a purpose to differentiate between encrypted and signed tokens, with local meaning the token has been symmetrically encrypted with a shared key, and public meaning that it has been signed with asymmetric cryptography. A newer standard built on top of Passetto does offer asymmetric encryption. Combining this version with the purpose tells you what algorithms to use. For example, a v4 public token means you should use EDDSA with the ED25519 curve using the defaults from the Libsodium library. The footer is similar to the header, but it is entirely optional due to the presence of a version and a purpose. Instead, the footer contains the remaining data from the header, such as the key ID, which, just like a jot, you still need to validate that it both belongs to the issuer and is suitable for the current version and purpose. While Passetto addresses some of the concerns around cryptographic agility, some people argue that it is wrong to be considered a replacement. This is because version is actually a very similar concept to the algorithm header. While it does tighten security by minimizing the algorithms to choose from, the attacker can still manipulate the algorithm and signature by changing the version and the payload. That being said, it does solve the issue of the algorithm of none. In my experience, I have seen more vulnerabilities caused by JOTs due to incorrect token payload validation rather than cipher suite agility. This could be due to insufficient issuer and audience validation or simply confusion caused by inadequate library design, such as badly named or documented APIs causing developers to only decode tokens when they expected validation. Since claim validation is still an issue with Passetto, I feel it does not offer that many benefits beyond its versioning policy. An alternative is Branca tokens. These tokens have a much more limited use case where they are only ever encrypted using a symmetric key. No requirements are present for what the payload can contain, and the various sections are just concatenated together and Base62 encoded. I mentioned Branca because it's a really simple alternative to using a JOT for local use. It's a great alternative if you're thinking of using a JOT signed with a symmetric algorithm, such as HS256. You get the same assurances of integrity and authentication, but you also get confidentiality out of the box, which is always good to have. This is my preferred approach for stateless local data. However, if you need instant revocation of individual tokens, maybe think about using stateful data and just passing around an opaque reference instead. In my opinion, these alternative token formats do not offer a compelling enough story to drop the popular JOT format that is widely used across all programming languages and technologies. Moving to a completely different format and dropping the use of mature JOT libraries also seems like a risk to me, since you are losing out on years of lessons learned with JOT payload validation and running the risk of old attacks becoming new. Besides that, these token types are very niche. You are unlikely to find any identity vendors or out-of-the-box software offering support for them. Another alternative I want you to consider is simply not using JOTs or any other type of token. Instead, use a cookie. While OAuth and therefore access tokens were initially created to work around the limitation of cookies for API security, Thanks to the same site flag, cookies are now back on the menu. By default, cookies are vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. 
This is where the browser will automatically attach your cookie to any request made to your domain. With modern browsers, you can now set cookies with the same site policy. When the same site policy is in effect, the browser will only attach a cookie to a request that is coming from the same domain. This means that your JavaScript app running on Pluralsight.com will be able to access Pluralsight.com slash API, but a request coming from my website would not. If you were thinking about a tokenized approach for your browser-based single-page application, then this approach can simplify your authentication and authorization architecture. You can still use OpenID Connect for user authentication, but you can skip technologies such as OAuth and JOTS for API access. Or you could even consider the backend for frontend pattern, abstracting away the OAuth and JOT usage behind a dedicated API for your single page app. To learn more about this approach, take a look at same site cookies and the backend for frontend pattern detailed in my Getting Started with OAuth course on Pluralsight. You can also find more details about JOT alternatives on my website and more details about why token versioning does not necessarily improve upon the algorithm header used by JOTs on Neil Madden's website. In this module, you learned how cryptographic agility can be taken advantage of by attackers and how best to mitigate these attacks with the job best practices you've seen throughout this course. You've learned how standardized claim types can improve interoperability and why you should always check the JOT claim registry to see if there are claims for your use case. You've learned how to architect token revocation, both for individual tokens or for all tokens at once in the case of a security incident. You also learned that there is more to JOTS than just the bearer authorization scheme, thanks to proof of possession techniques from OAuth such as NTLS and Depop. And finally, you saw an overview of some alternative token formats, and also how to remove JOTS from the browser by taking advantage of same site cookies. To learn more about JOT security best practices, I recommend checking out RFC 8725, a best current practices document from the OAuth Working Group. But if you've watched the entirety of this course, the content of this standard shouldn't be anything new to you. That's it for this course. Thank you for joining me. Till next time.